All right, welcome everyone. On behalf of the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, I'd like to thank you for joining today's webinar titled Solar Choice 2017. My name is Kyle James, and I'm the Development and Outreach Coordinator for the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. For those of you not familiar with the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, we are a nonprofit organization that for over 30 years has worked to promote responsible energy choices that work to address the impacts of global climate change and ensure clean, safe, and healthy communities throughout the Southeast. We are a membership organization and we would like to acknowledge our members on this call and encourage those of you who are not members to please join us today. For ways in which you can become a member and get involved, please visit our website at cleanenergy.org. Now I'd like to take a moment to review the basic functions of the WebEx control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. To ensure sound quality, all attendee lines will be muted throughout this presentation. Go ahead and find the three buttons along the top of your control panel. If you are having trouble hearing or seeing the slides, click the blue chat button and type in your problem so that I can help you troubleshoot. We also have saved time at the end of this presentation to answer any questions about today's topics. To ask a question, click the question mark button along the top of your screen. Make sure all panelists is showing up in the drop down menu and then type your question into the questions text box. We will do our best to answer the questions in the order that we receive them. So with that, I would like to turn it over to our first presenter today, Susan Glickman, the Florida Director for the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. Susan? Hi, Kyle. Thank you so much, and a welcome to everyone that is joining us on the call. So uh, we at Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, alongside uh, a number of other organizations, industry groups across the political spectrum, have been working to advance solar for many years. But it is in recent years that we're seeing a surge in activity and we've really had a changing conversation in the state of Florida starting in 2014. And I know a number of you all were involved in the solar uprising, which was a big event that took place at the Capitol that started to really, really bring attention to uh, solar and, and the potential for this growing industry. That continued in 2015 and many of you were involved in the solar Choice Amendment, which was an amendment, a citizen-led initiative to open up third-party sales in Florida, and that, um, as we all know, did not uh, make it on the ballot, uh, but in part uh, created a change conversation that helped in 2016 uh, to pass first in the Florida legislature what, what became uh, Amendment 4 on the ballot, and that appeared in August, so we've had some solar victories starting in, in 2016 when oh, Amendment uh, 4 passed with 73% of the vote. And um, then in November where Amendment 1, which was a utility-backed initiative that really started to create an alternative to the Solar Choice Amendment. And that did ultimately get on the ballot and was defeated in November um, fairly handily. And I think it, both of those two votes really together uh, speak volumes about the support that the public has uh, to grow solar in the state of Florida. And ultimately, the, the real big picture results of, of, of those two elections is that it is protected against sort of further attacks on solar, in particular through net metering policies. Uh, the solar industry have seen in other states around the country where uh, there have been punitive charges on solar customers that ultimately uh, would discourage solar. And so, of course, around the country in, in the state of Florida, we anticipated the possibility that we might see similar efforts um, in Florida, either through the Florida legislature or at the Public Service Commission. And um, happily, that, that has not really come to fruition, and we would, in a sense, give some credit to the fact that the solar support through the passage of Amendment 4 and the defeat of Amendment 1 is really, you know, sort of ringing pretty loudly uh, for policymakers in the state. There was a period of time where we started to hear dialogue at the Florida Public Service Commission and uh, dialogue that somehow non-solar customers are subsidizing solar customers. And, and we were concerned that just at the time when the solar industry is taking hold, that there would be efforts to sort of push, uh, push back. Um, the other, uh, I think, big picture result has been an overall increased just public awareness. So the, um, even though having to, to fight Amendment 1 had its downside, sort of the upside is 
it was an opportunity for increased public awareness about solar and the lack of solar really uh, in a big way in the state of Florida. And um, people are starting to uh, just sort of to understand it more, understand the cost have come down, understand the benefits of solar. Um, and I'm going to sort of segue into to the next bullet point and start really with the solar co-ops. Uh, just today there was an article in the Sun Sentinel about uh, the solar uh, co-ops that are developing, and I'm going to just go into that in a second, but the lead sentence in the story was if the recent battle over smart solar got you thinking about installing a rooftop solar system, here's one way to get more information. So the fact that there was so much attention paid um, to solar has really opened up people's minds to the opportunity. And one of those is the solar co-op program called FL Sun. That's a project of the League of Women Voters and a national organization called the Community Power Network. I should say the League of Women Voters of Florida. And this uh, project educates residents about the nuts and bolts of going, going solar, and they combine members' purchasing power to negotiate pricing and get a, a really good price for people. Uh, the Community Power Network oversees uh, 84 co-ops in six states, and already in Florida, there are two in Orange County, uh, two co-ops in the Tampa Bay area in St. Pete in northern Pinellas, Sarasota, and also over on the Space Coast. And already about 1,600 systems uh, have been installed through uh, the co-op. So they, they'll hold informational meetings and they solicit proposals from solar providers and then they help the co-op select a pro provider. So it does give uh, particularly people who are new to solar sort of the confidence in, um, um, you know, in who their provider is and so forth. And we're also seeing uh, more and more interest in uh, the uh, investor-owned utilities in the state. We have four large investor-owned utilities uh, of, of differing sizes, but uh, relatively large uh, investor-owned utilities. And uh, more and more, they are interested in solar in the Florida Power and Light, the largest uh, utility in the state, in their recent uh, rate increase. Part of the rate settlement involved uh, that they are going to be able to put up uh, 1,200 megawatts of solar. And uh, again, the other utilities are showing interest in that. I think we'll be seeing more and more large-scale solar um, installations. But, uh, and we'll go on to the next slide, as we still have work to be done, and that's really what this call is about, just to sort of let people know where things are at, and, and, and we're uh, going to increasingly create sort of a mechanism for people to get uh, further involved and, and more involved. So right now in the legislature, certainly the top priority um, is the uh, successful implementation of Amendment 4, and Senator Jeff Brandis filed a Senate bill 90, and it's uh, what would be considered a clean um, implementation bill of Amendment 4. It has been uh, heard in the first committee stop, um, which is communication um, and energy and public utilities, and that passed uh, unanimously there and is on the calendar for next week, next Tuesday in community affairs. And uh, it's obviously up in Tallahassee, so if any of you all want to plug in um, online or uh, Alyssa, perhaps we can send a note back around with a link to that or to be there in person, but it'll be on Tuesday the 21st at, at 1230. So far, uh, the companion bill has not been filed in the House, but it is widely anticipated that uh, Representative Ray Rodriguez, who is um, one of the, is the majority leader in the House, he was the uh, sponsor of the bill that went last year that put Amendment 4 in the ballot in the first place. So it is expected that he will file that bill this week. He is looking at some uh, language around uh, what he's calling consumer protections that had been um, uh, pushed in Arizona. And so there's a lot of conversations. We don't know what it'll finally look like, uh, but it may be a slightly different version. And at some point in the process, those things uh, have to be uh, worked out. But that is um, Amendment 4, so it seems to be going along, and uh, as uh, things evolve, there may be opportunities where it would be really useful to have people weigh in, particularly um, with the um, uh, their particular legislators. And Kyle, could we go to, just while we're on Senate 90, the next committee stops? 
and then I can come back. So I've just laid out for you this committee on Tuesday, Community Affairs, and we're gonna run through these pretty quickly and we're not going through all the legislator name, names, but if there's someone in your, uh, where you live, particularly your senator, um, on one of these committees, Community Affairs is next, and then it goes to the Appropriations Subcommittee um, over in Finance and Tax. Um, so if any of those lawmakers, we can go to the next slide as well. And then the last stop for Senate Bill 90, Kyle, yes, is the Appropriations Committee. So if you have relationships with or your um, lawmaker is on one of these committees, again, you're gonna have an opportunity and Alyssa has set up a Google Doc for those who wanna get, uh, sort of go to that next level and outreach uh, to lawmakers, but we want to make sure that you have sort of all the up-to-date um, information. And we'll go to the next slide and finish up on the Amendment 4 implementation. And these are the likely committee stops in the House. And again, the bill has not been filed, the companion bill yet. So the Energy and Utilities Subcommittee is actually a subcommittee of the Commerce Committee. And Kathleen Peters, um, who's from Pinellas County, is the chair of that, uh, that committee. So that's likely the first stop. Next slide. And then the Commerce Committee, so that's the full committee um, under which the House Energy Subcommittee sits. And uh, Jose Felix Diaz from Miami is the chair of that committee. And next slide. And then likely that would also see a stop in, in, in appropriations as well. So this is all readily available um, on the web um, at, at the, the legislative web, websites. So, um, Let's go back to the legislative update. I'm just gonna mention uh, two, two other bills. There has been a bill filed by Senator Jose uh, Javier Rodriguez that would um, change the definition of, uh, of who is a public utility. So it would exempt solar producers up to two and a half megawatts from being defined as a utility. Um, it, it, this gets at some of the elements of the third party sale issue, uh, it, it, not totally dissimilar to the Solar Choice Amendment. It's a long shot, it, it, it's perhaps unlikely to be heard, but we just wanted to make you aware that that has been filed. There's also a bill, House Bill 567, um, oh, and, I, and, and both of these bills do not have companion bills yet in, in the other house. So there is no companion bill to Senate Bill 456. Um, house Bill 567 is about streamlining certification. So it redefines certifying entities and allows a national standard from the National Renewable Energy Lab to be used. So that's gonna help solar installers, you know, make sure that there's no log jam in, in, um, in these certifications. And as the solar industry grows, I think that's gonna be um, in, important. So, all right, Kyle, why don't we, we jump ahead? We can pass through those, those committees. So really, we wanna make sure that all of you who've been interested in solar for, for some time and involved in, in the effort in, in, in uh, just a variety of ways, you know, continue to know, you know, what's coming up next and where can you weigh in. And we are building an army of solar supporters and that was one of the most gratifying things about, um, you know, the, the most recent ballot initiatives. We do need to be on guard at the legislature or at the Public Service Commission and Steve Smith is gonna go into uh, the role that the Public Service Commission plays in detail in just a moment. Or even when there's actions at, at local government levels. And you as an individual can join the solar co-op, there's no cost and you can at least see if your home is a candidate for solar and, and get, get more educated and help people. Uh, so there are places to plug in and I wanna encourage each one of you who wanna get more involved to sign into the Google Doc and that's gonna come up on the slides in just a minute. And my colleague, Alyssa Jean Schaefer um, has prepared that. So we're gonna give you more about where and how you can help. 2018 is gonna be another important election year. We're gonna have an open seat for governor and you know, obviously many legislative seats. So this is a critical year and we are looking at a um, sort of campaign that working with you all, with your help, for those people who really wanna kind of take things to the next level, about getting our elected officials on the record for support for solar. You know, we wanna get them on the record, we wanna keep people accountable and, and hold their feet to the fire. So. Again, you will have a chance to sign up on the Google Doc and then we'll can work, uh, you know, drill down with you and work with you more on, on how we do that. So now I'm gonna pass it over to, to Steve Smith 
who's going to talk about the Florida Public Service Commission and the important role uh, that they play in, in our energy choices in the advent of solar. Great. Thank you, Susan. Can everyone hear me okay? Is this coming through all right? Yes, sounds great. Okay, oh, perfect. Well, thanks everybody for joining. Again, my name is Stephen Smith. I'm the Executive Director of the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, and I'm on the Board of Directors for Floridians for Solar Choice. And again, we welcome everybody to the webinar and thank everyone who put in all the work last year to really elevate the solar issue. What I'd like to uh, focus in on, maybe we go to the next slide, is when we look at the future of solar and where we're going in solar in the Sunshine State, there are a number of different ways that solar is going to get uh, made available and put onto the ground, whether it be on the rooftop and in individual ownership, whether it be in a community fashion, or whether it be where or on tops of commercial buildings or large big box stores and others, or whether it's actually going to be deployed by the utilities, either where they own and build it or where they buy it through a power purchase agreement. Uh, all these mechanisms are going to be what is going to get more solar available in the Sunshine State, and it's going to bring us more clean energy. It's going to help us solve a lot of the challenges that we have. And we're looking at where do we have vulnerability? Where do we need to really have a strong citizen's voice? Where do we need to make sure that those of you who are part of the solar army or part of the solar supporters really understand where are the roadblocks and where are the areas that solar can get uh, derailed or hung up or bottled up or bad policies can be put in place. And we know, obviously, over the past 18 months, we've fought a pitched battle. All of us who have worked on the solar issue have fought a pitched battle with the big industrial-owned utilities over their misleading campaign, campaign, their interference with us trying to get third-party sales, um, and ultimately the, the defeat of that uh, in, in Amendment 1. But um, And going forward, we are hopeful that the investor-owned utilities and the other utilities are going to try to be more partners with the public instead of being adversaries and partners with solar and trying to do more. And we're seeing some signs of that with some of the utilities, um, but not all of them. The other place that we clearly need to do some focus and vulnerability uh, analysis and trying to figure out how to strengthen the public voice is with the Florida Public Service Commission. And if, if you look at the slides here, you can actually see the logo of the Florida Public Service Commission, and you can see that it affects you in so many different ways, whether it be through electricity, through water and sewer, through telecommunications, or through gas. The Florida Public Service Commission is probably the most important uh, government entity and regulator that you've probably never heard of or know very little about that affects your life in so many different ways. And the reality is that the Florida PSC is likely where some of the real important next battles are going to play out around solar power and solar power policy and what we do. And so at SACE and in conjunction with all of our partners at uh, Floridians for Solar Choice, we're beginning to really start a serious conversation about what does a public education campaign, what does a campaign look like to focus more people on understanding what this particular commission and how important this commission is to the future of solar in, in the state of Florida? So let's go to the next slide. So what, is the, what do they do? I mean, where do they come from? Who are these people? Uh, well, what they do are they, they basically play a critical role because they are quasi-judges, basically, because they sit on a panel, they listen to um, various industries and how the industries interact with the customers they're supposed to serve, and they serve as they're supposed to be an independent judge to evaluate um, uh, various disputes and various rate cases and other things like that that come up and how uh, rates are set and how services are provided and what are the rules of the road for a lot of these big utilities. And um, in the perfect world, they would be purely objective and they would basically do their job and they would look out for the best interests of the state of Florida. Uh, as many of you know uh, who paid attention, this really hasn't worked out that way. Um, many of us feel like the Florida Public Service Commission is largely made up of what I would characterize as captive, meaning that they are captive agents of the uh, entities that they're supposed to regulate. And, and many times they end up siding with the regulated industry over the best interest of consumers and, and other uh, potential competitors with these industries. And um, the, they, they make policy that, that can interfere with the 
in the case that we're talking about today with the development of, of clean renewable energy like solar power. Uh, they're appointed effectively by the legislature. The legislature has a committee that, that comes up with a group of them. They then let the governor uh, pick one out of a, a very narrow set that they put forth to the governor. And then they are appointed uh, to serve uh, on the commission. Um, and basically they, they are, again, the judge and the jury, and they sort of make the decisions that affect us in so many different ways. How does this affect solar? Well, they are really the keeper of the, the net metering uh, rule and regulations in Florida. They're the ones that, are, that we believe are likely where we're going to have a net metering fight uh, in the future because they are the entities that the utilities have come to and begin to make the case that somehow or another people who are putting solar on their home are not paying their fair share. They're also the place that if you are a solar company and say Florida Power and Light or Duke Energy wants to propose a solar project and you think you can actually put the project on the ground cheaper than the, uh, the investor-owned utility can, uh, they're the ones that control the rules for competitive solar bidding. They're also the ones that control the rule for any sort of generation because if a, if a company uh, like, like Florida Power and Light or somebody else comes to the utility and says, we need to build new generation, be it a, a gas plant or a nuclear plant, they go through what's called a need determination. And that need determination is basically where the commission says you can build it and we will guarantee that you will get paid back for it effectively through rate recovery. And um, whether the commission wants to hear any competitive bids or whether they want to have anybody come in and maybe offer an alternative plan for how the utility is to meet that power instead of building all natural gas or building another nuclear plant, this is where those decisions are made in front of these five individuals uh, who are, again, the judge and the jury for this. The future of power production in Florida is, is developed in front of the commission through what are called 10-year site plans. And again, all of the rate cases, and we just saw the big rate case with uh, FP&L, where you know, FP&L came in with a significant increase and they basically got most of it through the commission. Uh, Gulf Power right now, we're an intervener, the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy and the League of Women Voters and the Sierra Club and some others have intervened in the Gulf Power case, which is the, the uh, investor-owned utility in the panhandle of Florida, because they're trying to add very high, what are called fixed charges in other words, before you even turn the light switch on in your house, they're saying instead of only paying what is already a high charge, $18 a month in a fixed charge, now you're potentially going to have to pay $48 a month. And they're moving uh, other charges into that fixed charge. And really what that does is it damages the economics for solar and energy efficiency, because if you use less power, you still have to pay this fixed charge. And so we've seen it as, a, as an end round to try to go after net metering and damage uh, solar uh, development in the state of Florida. We've intervened. We're arguing against that, and that case is coming up before the commission uh, in March uh, of this year. So this entity, again, as I said before, is probably the most important entity that you really never heard of. It's the most important entity that um, really is going to impact policy going forward. Next slide. So what are we going to do about it? I mean, what, what, what can citizens do uh, the legislature appoints these people. They're, uh, as one of my favorite uh, conservatives said, they are uh, unelected bureaucrats that really are accountable to nobody. They basically uh, serve. Um, and uh, many of these people uh, end up leaving the uh, commission and go to work for the people that they actually used to regulate. And we've got numerous examples of that. The revolving door is a real problem. Uh, they seem to be again, captive in the uh, sense that they tend to be uh, overly responsive to the, uh, basically, the companies that they are supposed to regulate. So one of the things that we are looking at, and we're going to be doing a, a study of this and, and doing a report on it, we're interested in getting people's feedback, is maybe these individuals should be elected as opposed to appointed. So there is at least some measure of accountability that they periodically have to come back before the people of Florida. Now, we're not naive. We understand how that process can be influenced too. But right now, if you have uh, people that are being appointed by the legislature and they are completely unresponsive to the, the public interest and they're largely uh, hostile to solar policy and hostile to renewable energy and hostile to energy efficiency, 
Uh, maybe it's time that we actually had some elected accountability there. So that's one of the things we're looking at because they have been elected in Florida before. In the states north of Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, they're all elected. Uh, so there are some advantages and disadvantages, but it's a way to potentially look at reforming. The other thing is there is an Office of Public Counsel that is really supposed to look out for the public interest there, and uh, they are trying to do their job, but they tend to be underfunded and, and somewhat relegated to the side, and it, we're not sure that they actually have the, the strength and the power they need to to really be a strong public advocate. So figuring out how to work with the Office of Public Counsel and figuring out how to strengthen their hand in looking out for the greater public interest is something. And again, ethics reform to make sure that these individuals are not really able to sort of come serve for a while on the commission and then get extraordinarily lucrative jobs consulting or working with the industry that they regulated so that really this is like being on the public service commission is like a job interview to effectively go work for some of these companies later. And then therefore you're making sure that you're doing decisions that help them. And if the utilities don't want citizens owning solar, well, you make sure that you work against that or whatever. These are the kind of corruptions that we may need to address uh, in front of the Florida Public Service Commission. So what, what we wanted to do today is say, in addition to what Susan pointed out, in real time, what is going on in the legislature and the need to get Amendment 4 implemented, the need to continue to communicate with the legislative branch, and then also being aware that next year we have an open gubernatorial seat and we need the army of solar supporters to be uh, on their toes and really demanding that as we go into the elections next year that we have people who are really accountable and strong supporters and defenders of solar. We have this entity that is so fundamentally critical to the policies of solar going forward that we believe starting a public education campaign and really starting to help people understand who these people are, what they do and what their decisions are, and where we have potential vulnerabilities in making bad policy that is anti-solar, these five individuals, and again, this picture is dated because Lisa Eggers, the woman standing up to the, uh, as you look at the picture, uh, to the left of the woman sitting down, uh, she has already rolled off and there's a new gentleman that has been brought on. But there is need for all of us to know who these people are and basically be focused on what they do. So we'll be in touch with you, giving you more information. Why don't we go to the next slide? So as Susan mentioned, we have developed a Google form that you can actually go to. You can see the URL here. And what we're asking for people to do is go on there and let us know, click on this and let us know what of these areas, getting uh, with your elected official, getting your elected official on the record in support of solar. Maybe it's a solar pledge or something that we do going into the, uh, uh, the rest of this legislative uh, cycle and into the election next year that really begins to get people on the record. Are you going to be a solar defender? Can we count on you as we make our decision about who we want to vote for going forward? You know, emailing elected officials, calling elected officials, visiting the, uh, the, your local office so they know that you're a solar supporter and that you vote. Um, attending a lobby day in Tallahassee, potentially. Participating in a campaign to reform the Public Service Commission or be part of public uh, comments that before the Public Service Commission uh, and helping us educate people about this entity that is uh, so powerful but yet so little uh, known and so little sunshine being put on them. Um, these are all kinds of things. So if you go to this URL, you see it right there on the site, um, and make sure that you fill this out. This will help us be in touch with you as solar supporters as we begin to gear up the next phase of this campaign, both implementing what the votes that were taken last year and uh, working on where we have potential vulnerabilities and where we need to be making good solar policy. So next slide. I think that's it. Um, so, again, we want to thank each and every one of you for all the great work, all the things that have happened. We've really uh, made solar uh, an important issue collectively uh, in the state of Florida, and the solar uprising continues. We're looking at the next steps, working with each and every one of you. And so let's uh, turn it back to um, Kyle. Are you going to ask the questions? Is that how we want to do it? Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to remind everyone that if you want to ask a question here, click the Q&A button on the top right corner. Uh, we've already received a bunch of great questions, so we'll jump right in here, but I just wanted to remind everyone how to do that. 
So Steve, this first question is going to be for you. So it's asking, are the power companies obligated to work with the solar companies who install rooftop residential solar? And will that have to allow net metering? Well, the good news is there already is a, a, a pretty good net metering law in the state of Florida. It's not perfect, but it's, it's decent. And yes, if people want to uh, put solar on their homes uh, in the uh, territory of the investor-owned utilities, there is a requirement that they work with you and you do have that option of net metering. Um, as you get into some of the public power entities like the munis and the co-ops, most of them honor that, but some of them now uh, are beginning to dial that back a little bit. And so we, we are seeing some uh, weakness in some, particularly some of the co-ops about not wanting to work with people uh, with net metering as much or not being as friendly uh, to solar installations. But as a general rule, um, yes, they are obligated to work with you, and they generally will. And if you have an example of a uh, utility that is, is giving you a hard time or failing to do that, please get in touch with us because we might be able to help out or work with the solar industry to make sure that, that those uh, uh, barriers that somebody may be putting up are addressed. And Steve, this question kind of rolls right into that one. So what do you think a realistic timeline might be when we could see installations by Sunrun and Solar City? Well, the reality is that uh, Solar City, as you know, was recently uh, uh, acquired by Tesla, and I think they're changing the name to Tesla. But Solar City is actually already operating. Test Solar City Tesla is already operating in the state of Florida, uh, primarily in the Orlando market, but they're looking at expanding in some other areas. Um, I don't know as much about Sunrun. They've been working in South Carolina, and I think they're looking at the the, the Florida market. I do know that Vivint is also a similar type of company that is doing uh, some of the uh, development, uh, uh, solar development uh, on a large scale uh, with residential customers in, uh, in the Tampa market. And so we're going to see more of those entities, but there's already a great number of great local solar installers on the ground that are working, as Susan said, with the FL Sun co-ops and then also on their own individually and there is a state association that is a big partner with uh, us and Floridians for Solar Choice called PLACIA, the Florida Solar uh, Energy Industries Association. And they have members throughout the state that are doing uh, great work. So we've got a, we don't have any shortage of really having companies on the ground. What we've been missing is having a good policy and uh, making sure that the tax policy uh, is uh, is in place that allows these these systems to be put on people's homes and businesses. Great. And Susan, I'll let you tackle this next one. Um, somebody asked, what's the total number of residential rooftop installations in Florida, and what would be the number necessary to achieve critical lobbying strength? Well, we currently, currently based on the most recent reporting by the utilities, to the Public Service Commission have 11,626 uh, net metered customers in the state. And the four investor and utilities, it was roughly about 8,900. Uh, the, it was surprising the, the we have, you know, municipal electric companies like Lakeland and Jacksonville and Orlando um, in Tallahassee, and then we do have some rural co-ops, and, and there was a fair amount uh, in, amongst the rural co-ops of, of that number, but 11,626 total. So it's really around a tenth of a percent out of 9 million electricity customers. So uh, there's plenty of, of room for improvement, um, but that's where we are now. And, and I just wanted to add something to this net meter conversation. I mean, one area where you do hear complaints is, so the utilities have an obligation to net meter you, and they will credit you a retail rate, and this is what Steve just said, we have a pretty decent net metering rule. So you get credited a retail rate up to what you use. So if you generate, the same amount as you use, you're getting a retail rate, but if you generate even a single kilowatt more than what you use, you're going to get um, the what they call the avoided uh, cost rate. Uh, there was a big conversation yesterday, a presentation in the House Energy Committee on renewables and the issue of avoided cost, and in one instance they were talking about a waste to energy facility that was getting 1.6 cents. So if your electricity out of the wall is 10 and a half or 11 cents a kilowatt hour, and again, this was a, a, a solid waste facility recycling 
and uh, um, uh, Waste Energy Facility in Miami-Dade County, and they, their long-term contract ended in 2013, and they're getting 1.6 cents, that was what they were saying was avoided cost, so I'm just passing that on. So you can imagine the differential. So that is one complaint that I hear. If someone has an oversized system, uh, then, you know, you get the retail rate up to what you use, but over that you're getting a much lower rate. So that is an area, and, and as he said, that is still considered a, a decent metering rule, but I just want people to understand, um, you know, what they're up against there. Absolutely. And Susan, this next question is also going to be for you. Are there any Tea Party or Trump supporters in the leg legislature that are supporting solar? Well, I would yes, absolutely, and it's um, one of the most uh, heartening things and, and, and interesting and powerful things about the whole solar uprising in general and the solar choice uh, movement has been uh, people who come in the free market and competition door, and I'm seeing more and more of an understanding of that from from just lawmakers, from lawmakers on these energy committees who, um, you know, are even new to this, but they're just looking at their their conservative values, values that mar value free market and competition, and they are wondering, you know, why sort of there are some of the policies in place uh, that we have. I heard a legislator uh, at the first House Energy Committee say, well, what's built into our system to make this more efficient? and um, you know, we're, we're just at a really interesting crossroads around energy and just not dissimilar to where folks once were in the whole telecommunications realm and, you know, and, and things are changing and the smart utilities are going to be the ones who are ahead of the curve and they're meeting, you know, their customers' needs and demands and, and they're paying close attention to the shifting costs. That's another huge factor is the cost for solar has just come down so exponentially um, that right now, you know, they, they were talking about prices for utility scale solar and even at, um, I was $507 a megawatt for FPL system, you know, you're talking about five cents a kilowatt hour and that really is cheaper than you're gonna build a new natural gas plant. So, so there's just an interesting, confluence of things happening all at once and the back to the you know conservatives in the in the political process you know they this is not lost on them and they like free market type forces so i do think you're seeing you know just some changing attitudes in the legislature i would say that definitely and steve i'll let you tackle the next one are there any plans to expand opportunities for property owners property owners interested in pace financing for solar gear projects specifically for commercial property owners uh, yeah, I believe that there are a number of uh, PACE um, com companies that are working in various parts of the state. Um, and uh, if the, whoever asked that question um, would um, would like to, you know, tag their name, we can certainly get you some more information to some folks that are doing that. So I, I know that there is uh, there's a lot of activity there, and PACE is a great. Uh, additional mechanism to sort of work through uh, getting some of the costs down. So yeah, and, you know, and let me just the, add. Can I add to that? Well, hold, hold on just a second. So you yeah. know, I know that the, uh, the the Y Green and there's a Pace corridor in South uh, South Florida that is doing down in Miami and others. And uh, Mayor uh, Phil Stoddard, who uh, is is involved in that, and others. So there's quite a bit of activity. So we can certainly uh, get some more information about that and potentially even allow, we could do a potentially another um, a webinar on just the sort of the pace aspects of this, because there's a lot of, lot of opportunity there. Great, and I'd like to take a quick moment to intervene the Q&A here, and I'm gonna hand it over to our volunteer coordinator, Allie Brown at the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, who's gonna quickly take a poll during the webinar here. So Allie, do you wanna explain that real quickly? Yeah, sure. Hey, everybody. And just want to say I recognize so many of our awesome Solar Choice volunteers here and want to thank everyone for joining us and, you know, continuing to fight with us. I know Steve mentioned at the end that we're going to have a more detailed form for you to fill out, but we wanted to try something new on our webinar here where you can kind of chime in um, immediately with a poll that we have that I'm going to open up in just a minute. Um, so hopefully now you will see it on your screen. Um, on the right-hand side. 
So the first question is, are you interested in getting elected officials on the record in support of solar? So our form here that we send you later on will be more detailed. That could involve a host of things like a lobby day, calling or emailing elected officials, you know, things that Susan talked about at the beginning. And the second question, and again, these aren't either or, if you're interested in involving, engaging in both, let us know, um, is what Steve spoke later on um, involving the Public Service Commission reform issues. So it looks like a good amount of you are filling it out. We'll give you just a little bit more time. And again, really want to stress uh, the importance of filling out the Google form that we're going to send you because there you can weigh in. We'll get your contact information if we don't already have it. And you can, you know, explain to us a little bit more about what you're interested in doing. So we'll give it Great. just a second, and then I will close the poll out. Great. Thanks, Allie. And while we're doing that, we'll continue with the Q&A here. So, Steve, what has been done to allow individuals to install solar and connect to the grid without getting permission from FPL prior to installation? Is FPL still controlling state funds for rebates and tax credits for the state of Florida? Well, my understanding is there really, there really are not any rebates coming or, or uh, tax credits coming from the state of Florida. Those were largely uh, eliminated back in the uh, FECA proceedings of 2014. Uh, you do get a federal tax credit uh, that is basically with the, uh, the IRS if you do solar, which is an investment tax credit. But the state of Florida, to my knowledge, is not providing uh, uh, rebates or, or, or state level uh, tax policy at this point. Um, now, um, Kyle, I think say, say the first part of that question again. I mean, generally, uh, you can, you need to enter, if you want to interconnect where you're actually going to feed back uh, to the grid, you do need to work with your local power company because there are some real and legitimate issues that arise from when you are uh, backfeeding onto the, uh, the distribution network and the grid. But if you are, say, off the grid or you're uh, uh, only what's called behind the meter, which means that you're not um, feeding back onto the, the actual uh, distribution network, I think there are, there are some codes and things that you would need to follow, but the utility can't really interfere with you until you start to interact with them uh, through the distribution network. Right, and the first part of that question was, what has been done to allow individuals to install solar and connect to the grid without getting permission from the FPL? Well, that's that's where I that's what I thought I understood. Yeah, I, yep. if, as long as, if you're off the grid or you have a standalone, say, shed or something on your property, um, you you don't have to get permission to put solar on something like that. It's really the only time that you really need to interact. Uh, with the utility is if you are going to be what is called backfeeding or net metering or uh, putting uh, material back, on, I mean, putting electrons back onto the grid. I think if you're, everything's happening behind the meter, I think you have a lot of control about what you do. I think it's always a good idea to communicate, but I don't think you necessarily need permission, and that's, that's your property. Now, there may be, again, some uh, codes that you need to follow, but the utility, if you're not backfeeding onto their system, you can do what you want with your own property. Right. Okay, Susan, I'll let you tackle the next one. Has anyone from the Florida Women's March movement reached out to SACE? They are mobilizing a large amount of folks who want to get involved in just what you were recommending. Well, I actually spoke at the march in St. Petersburg where it was a beautifully glorious day of beautiful weather and about 25,000 people were there. Now, I don't know that everybody could hear what we were saying on the stage, but so I have interacted. If someone has sort of the next steps and I um, had offered up to folks that I've interacted with that as someone who's been involved in advocacy for my whole adult life, you know, I would be happy to be part of trainings or, or educating people on the, on the, you know, sort of the energy and climate side of things. Um, so if somebody wants to shoot a note, you'll see my email, susan at cleanenergy.org will show up as well as Alyssa's and you can always ping us. So, um, so it, it certainly is a group of enthusiastic people and one of the reasons that we're having this webinar and it is a challenge in general is sort of keeping people 
engaged with, with doing things meaningful. And one thing I will commit to you is, you know, Southern Alliance of Energy, and we really, really uh, respect and appreciate people's time and what, you know, we will ask you to do will be meaningful. And uh, so I would always love that opportunity if there are more and more people who want to be come engaged in their communities uh, to be helpful to them. So, so please uh, give me the hookup if there's some that someone else I ought to be talking to. Awesome. And we'll have Susan's email on the very last slide at the end as well. Uh, this next question is for Steve. Are there any efforts underway to open up community solar farms in Florida, i.e. group-owned systems where individuals own a share of the project and receive a share of the power produced? Well, you know, it's an excellent question. And uh, community solar is a whole area that uh, is, is, is rapidly growing in a lot of parts of the, the country. Uh, in Florida, what we've seen mostly has been programs that we don't believe bring a lot of value to the, the customers who sign up for them. In other words, they're largely managed by the, the investor-owned utilities, and they, um, they don't share a lot of the benefit from the solar. They just have people sort of pay into it, and then the, the payback for the, for the customers that pay in is either so minimal or de minimis that it, it's problematic. Golf has one of those. Um, FP&L has a kind of a bogus program where they have people pay a little extra, but they really don't get a lot of benefit from it. It's all really more eyewash. Now, um, Orlando has had a pretty good program, a uh, community solar program that they did, and it, it actually was oversubscribed, where there was more value to customers who signed up. And, um, we are we're very interested in encouraging more of those because there are people that either live in apartment complexes or maybe they don't have the right orientation or their roof isn't uh, proper for solar and so um there is uh activity in that direction but again it really matters how those programs are designed and um and i think it matters that that when uh, utilities are looking at it that they make sure that the um the value flows through to all customers. Now, what isn't available in Florida, as I understand it, is where you have a private independent of the utility uh, company, like you see in some other states, where they actually aggregate customers together and then they build the system and provide it. That was, again, part of what was the, the barrier to what's called third-party sales. Because right now, if you're not a utility, you can't sell electrons to anybody else. Um, and therefore, it, it, it blocks the ability to have community solar programs that are provided by an entity other than the utility itself. Okay. And I have another question for you, Steve. Um, let's see. Are there materials for distribution at festivals, et cetera, this year? Having the petitions the past years was helpful in engaging people. And I will say before, and Steve, that the survey that we're sending around is likely important for developing these type of materials moving forward here. That's, that's right, and, and I think it's an, it's an excellent question, and I think that what we are looking at is, um, given that, uh, as Susan talked about, that we have the election next year, um, trying to find materials that are um, able to influence uh, people's decisions on voting next year relative to solar, I think are going to be important, and we're looking at developing that. The other thing is, after we, we do a little bit more work on the Public Service Commission, we believe that there will be some things that we will have as far as campaign materials to really have a target for people to uh, engage at festivals and other things to educate people about the importance of, of solar. Um, we do have materials now about uh, the amendment for uh, implementation that we can uh, share with folks. And again, the legislative legislature will be in session until uh, early May. And so for the springtime, uh, we can certainly get some materials to people who are interested about what is before the legislature currently. Uh, but I think as far as sort of what is the next big target that we're going to be mobilizing folks on, uh, we are still coalescing around that and um, working to uh, likely develop a campaign around the Public Service Commission uh, if the investor-owned utilities continue to behave, it may be that they want to act up. But right now, they seem to be uh, willing to sort of work, uh, play nice with everybody. Great. Okay. Um, Susan, I'll let you tackle this one. Have re residential solar system pricing gone down? Will they continue to do so? 
Well, yes, pricing has come down both residential and, and utility uh, scale solar and having um, actually had a proposal done um, through the solar co-op in my county myself personally, you know, it was roughly um, a six year payback and, um, you know, that's, that is uh, really uh, vastly improved and, and, and Steve, you may want to weigh in as someone who has had solar on your roof for a long time and we're seeing figures in utility scale of, you know, five cents, under five cents a kilowatt hour. The city of Tallahassee has a big project and it's under five cents a kilowatt hour. So if you can, you know, put solar on your roof on your residence and get a six year payback, you know, you're essentially going to make that payment anyway. So, um, uh, and and then the real trick ultimately is the financing. Someone asked to Steve a question about PACE. And just in case anyone doesn't know that is property assess clean energy where you use your tax bill to finance and it can also be energy efficiency improvements as well as, as solar and, and, and as he said, different communities are kind of in a different uh, state of play. Uh, one of the trends I wanted to mention is, is, is a lot of these open vendors that used to be like the South Florida uh, Corridor, why, why Green was the chosen vendor in other communities like the city of Orlando, Broward County. They're having an open vendor process so you can go through, um, you know, and, and, and that's good because it creates competition even among, uh, uh, even among the solar. So some of that is driving you know, cost down as you're getting, uh, you're getting more competition. And uh, lastly, just the whole notion of the solar co-op is to do, you know, kind of uh, power and buying like Walmart, you know, does in kind of a volume uh, buying. And I know that, uh, you know, those prices have come in uh, even lower. So, so the answer is yes. And then you have the investment tax credit. Um, you know, as well, that was renewed for five years. So the costs are getting more affordable, that's for sure. Great, that's good to hear. And before our last question here, I want to turn it back to our volunteer coordinator, Allie, to give us sort of the results on the in-webinar polling. Yeah, sure, I'll keep it really brief, but so excited to see that you're all very interested in, in everything that we're working on. Um, it looks like Engaging elected officials is only a tad bit more popular than PSC reform, um, and less than 10% of you guys said that you weren't interested in either. So overall, it looks like we have a lot of enthusiasm moving forward, and again, want to emphasize the importance of filling out that Google form that will circulate later on. And if you didn't have a chance to fill out this quick poll or couldn't figure it out, no worries at all, because the form that we send out will be um, have a lot more information. So thanks, y'all. Great, thanks, Allie. And our last question here is for Steve. On base utility rates, allowing utilities to put in a service charge essentially takes away their argument that solar customers, I'm sorry, I lost, solar customers transfer the cost of the grid to non-solar users. Even if it makes the solar economics less competitive, can it help long-term? Well, let me see if I, I understand that. So are, are, is the question about a, a fixed charge uh, as opposed to the volumetric uh, component of the bill? In other words, that the, the volumetric is yes, what you yes, pay exactly. per, per kilowatt hour, and then there's the fixed charge. This is, this is the case that we're in with Gulf Power right now before the Florida Public Service Commission. Um, and all I can do is speak for the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, and we've looked at this. It, it is not unreasonable for there to be some portion of a fixed charge. The question is, what part of the overall bill gets put into the fixed charge portion and what part stays in the, the volumetric portion? And this can get very complicated very quickly, but the, the gist of what I think the question is, um, would we be supportive of allowing uh, some additional fixed charge component uh, if it if it if it was beneficial to the utilities where they were not as aggressive in trying to undermine uh, things like net metering, I think the answer is yes if it's done in a smart way. Uh, but what we saw with Gulf Power was that going from eighteen dollars, which is already the highest in the state and one of the highest that I've heard about in the country, uh, up to forty eight dollars, where they were moving other components uh, of you know, demand charges and everything else into the fixed component and and reducing a little bit the volumetric component, we really found that unacceptable because again, it's 
the economics of your solar system or baking energy efficiency investments is if you if you use less kilowatt hours, um, that's where you get the savings. If you if you have a non bypassable fixed charge that re requires you to have to pay this, um, and particularly if it's not justified and not efficiently applied to each customer, then the economics really are less advantageous for doing energy efficiency in solar. And basically, what you're doing is you're just you're kind of a captive agent of the of the utility that is forced to pay higher and higher fixed charges, and you can't control your own economics that way. And so um, it's it's a complicated issue when you really get into it, but um, we're not opposed to, you know, reasonable fixed charges that are based on legitimate uh, uh, fair rate-making principles. What, we're, what we are opposed to is extraordinary uh, fixed charges like we've seen manifest with Gulf Power, and that's why we're so strongly opposing that, um, that, that are really designed to ruin the economics for efficiency and, and solar and are just really overreaching by a monopoly to uh, uh, not allow customers to manage their own economics. Great, all right, well, that's about all the time we have today. I wanna be respective of time. So again, I wanna thank Steve and Susan for the great presentation, and I wanna thank everyone for joining us today and for your thoughtful questions. Uh, if we didn't get a chance to answer any of your questions, please email it to Alyssa or Susan at the email shown here. Um, and to answer many people's questions, today's presentation has been recorded and will be available on the webinar archive page of cleanenergy.org. And we will also email you the webinar recording once it has been processed, along with the link to the Solar Choice Survey that we talked about today. Um, if you enjoyed today's presentation, consider joining SAE so that we can continue to work towards clean energy solutions for Florida and the Southeast as a whole. Please visit cleanenergy.org for info on how to join and become involved. So take care, everybody, and have a great rest of the week.